Good morning and welcome to D for Diving's YouTube channel and today we're going to have a little conversation about the mental process associated with becoming a dive professional, becoming a dive master and we're looking at it as changing gear. Music. Da, 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 da. Yep. <laughs> Do you remember those times rocking up onto a dive boat, everything's taken care of, you've got water on the boat, you've got your mm. equipment on the boat, everything's, yeah. you know, the, the dive site's thought of, and all you have to do is just put your gear on, yeah. roll in, go diving. Enjoy the dive, enjoy the fish. You're, have, you're even shown stuff. Stuff gets pointed out yeah, to you, and, yeah. and you don't have to really pay that much attention. You it's don't just, even have to rinse your gear at the end. You, you know, you finish the dive, you get back yeah. on the boat, and you go and chill out on the on the sunshine, and, and yeah. just you know, do a little bit of sunbathing, maybe have a drink, and your gear's taken care of. Yeah. Everything, you know. Do you remember all of that? That was yeah, that was easy, this wasn't it? Those, those halcyon days, yeah. Relaxing, you feel like in a holiday the entire time. Yeah, and that's yeah. how it should be. You, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Except it's not. For a dive master and a dive professional, that's not how diving is. It's a job, it's something that we, we do and there's a lot of tasks and a lot of responsibilities. And it takes a mental process for us to click into gear and start to think about all of the different things that need to be done. So how is this possible? Well, what you experience as a diver when you rock up and everything's all ready and we know where we're going and the boat's got fuel and the, all the equipment's on there, is it's kind of like the analogy of a graceful swan where the swan looks elegant and it looks effortless as it's moving yeah. through the water and, and everything is just designed for purpose. And what you don't see underneath the water is that the little swan's feet are going like mad as it's trying struggle. to get to the right place. The, yeah, the struggle. So yeah. just, just, you know, let's have a thought about the dive masters and the boat skippers and the crew and the struggle. It's real, the struggle. All, all the effort that's behind of a dive operator to make it work for fun divers. And make it look effortless. Yeah, make exactly. it look like the graceful swan. In, in order to provide that service that we i mean the, the quality service that everybody comes looking for and that's that's the key thing it's the service that we're looking to try to mm -hmm. uh, 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 obtain and, uh, and deliver when we have new divers who are going to become dive professionals dive master candidates there's a mental process that we need to take them through mm -hmm. that takes them from being a recreational diver who just rocks up and has everything done for them to being that person who can now take responsibility and some of those mental processes they have to mm -hmm. go through are things like logistics and logistical planning. What equipment do you need for the day's diving? How many tanks, what O2 kit, whatever specialist equipment they need. Mm -hmm. But also looking at the types of diver that we've got and maybe choosing sites. Um, now there are some locations where they'll choose the sites and then the divers will sign up if they want to go there. Certainly here in the Caribbean, we don't necessarily have that, that demand and that, that base of people. So we have to change our site selection based on the people who are on the boat. So if I would like to go and do the troll, uh, one of the deeper wrecks and then have a brand new diver, I have to change my site selection or tell them they can't dive. But we need to then be thinking about also the, the, the timeliness of the dives. How long a dive can we go for? What time, what's the surface interval gonna be? Then the second dive in order that people can get back and get lunch. Or if we've got a boat going out in the afternoon for us to turn around and get the boat back out for the afternoon session. Um, yeah. So there's a lot of logistical planning that a new dive leader needs to be thinking about and be aware of the bigger picture so that they can fit mm -hmm. into that and plan their activity and their dives with their divers for that session. I think it's basically opening like the, the door to backstage for, yes. for a fun diver to actually see what, go, what goes on behind the scenes of a dive show. Yeah, I mean, not, not that's, least that's involved. Not least when you're humping and dumping 40 tanks onto yes. the boat in the morning. Exactly. Yay. <laughs> you guys don't get to see that often. I'll send them a as a gift and I'll you. The second thing that, that, that a new dive pro would need to look at uh, as, a, as a mental process is then looking at safety and risk management. It's one of those things where there may be risks that I would be prepared to accept for me if I was diving because I have a risk profile that's here. If I'm assuming responsibility for other people then I might lower my risk profile because there are activities that I would do as an experienced diver that maybe a newer diver or maybe somebody who's older and less fit might not be able to do. 
case in point, taking people down south. Yeah. Um, Diving on a in. really fast drift dive, for example, yeah. or, or, or doing live drop-offs or live pickups, sometimes it might be a little bit more challenging for some people. Exactly. Part of what we need to be thinking about as a mental process mm -hmm. is what are the considerations, what are the divers we've got, what are the options that we have available to us, yeah. making sure that we have eyes on and, and we're constantly monitoring the divers, particularly if we're diving in more challenging conditions, if the current's a bit uh, mm -hmm. uh, faster or if the surface chop and the swell is, is pretty big. We're, you know, what are, what are options? We had it only a couple of weeks ago diving with an older diver. As we turned the corner, we could feel a bit of current and, and I had to make the decision, do we push on uh, I only need to swim another 30 meters and the current will swing around the other way again or do I turn around and go back um, and because the diver was older and was a potential heart attack risk you make the choice turn around and go back don't don't push it for that extra 30 meters or so yeah and I think for um, fun divers in general uh, you can see that mind changing Thing when they do, for example, the rescue course, and they're very fresh. They, they just done the rescue course, and they go into dive master. So all that information is kind of fresh when it comes to risk management. Yeah. But then when you have someone who's just doing the dive master after over a year of having done the rescue course, you need to refresh all of that. Yes. Because yeah. of course you, you you're just a fun diver as a rescue, so you just keep fun diving. Uh, although you do learn to uh, do risk management and to actually take care and start worrying about other people beside yourself underwater, uh, it, it only becomes real when you are a dive master, yeah. not, not on a rescue level. Yeah, yeah. no, I, I think you're right. I think mm. you're right. Well, the other thing that is very important for uh, new DMs is to have a very good navigation skills and uh, develop their communication with divers, especially underwater. I mean, everybody underwater loses a couple of uh, IQ points, so your hand signals need to be quite clear, and you need to step up and improve those skills underwater. Are you, are you referring to maybe a dive master that we know um, and their they're, they're they, ponchon yeah. for jazz hands? Yeah, <laughs> like, how much have you got? Well, the net, <laughs> yes. <laughs> Can do a, a, a stop, the, I think. The three minutes, safety stuff. <laughs> Sorry. As, as yes. Sorry. It's really important that, yeah, navigation is important, obviously. Yeah. You need to know where you are on, on a dive site, but also how to communicate the navigation. So it may be that uh, a dive pro, an experienced dive pro, will turn up here, and I don't need to take him out uh, or her out for 20 dives on the dive for her to be able to navigate. She knows, he or she would know how to navigate, and therefore I would just need to draw up a plan with the key waypoints and they would be able to dive it and get out and back to the boat without too many issues. A newer diver needs to learn those skills and, and understand how we navigate and how we progress through through a dive site and how we communicate what's going on and how we communicate direction and work together yeah. as a team. Yeah. And so whilst we do have some dive pros here, when they are communicating what's going on or where they are, they, they are like this um, and you've no idea what, they, what they're yeah. trying to tell you. And so it's about as part of navigation and communication, being able to, you, this way, 10 fin kicks, yeah. make it nice and clear and, yeah. and obvious what it is you're trying to say. And also navigation means um, sort of administer your time uh, around the dive site. Sometimes you may encounter, <laughs> for example, a lot of current and a new dive guide will just take you and keep finning and you will realize that you ended your dive like at 25, 30 minutes. That's Sisters. not what we really yeah. want. Or, or, slow the dive down. Yeah, slow it down or, or check for people and just say, t tell everybody, just slow down. There's no need to fin because otherwise, yeah, people are paying here to, to, to be underwater. Well, I would say a little bit more than 30 minutes. Yes. I mean, come I'd on. We usually go. Yeah, I'd yeah. be disappointed too. We usually go for 45, 50 minute dives. And if we have like amazing days and great conditions, we have no problem of extending that time to maybe an hour sometimes. Yeah, yeah. Certainly yeah. people have still got air and, yeah. and we can factor it into. Yeah. The logistical plan yeah, um, exactly yeah yeah so another one that we look at as, a, as again as a mental process that, that new dive pros need to learn or be able to be cognizant of and that is observation and issue resolution and we often refer to it as having eyes in the back of your head as we're diving I'm constantly monitoring the divers and trying to make sure that if there is an issue I can try to 
uh, address the issue before it becomes a problem. Uh, at the point that somebody is becoming stressed or concerned, I can address the problem. So one of the ones that we quite often will see, particularly with divers when they don't know where we are, yeah. is they're getting low on air and they'll signal to me that I'm low on air. I'm down at 50 bar, quarter of a tank. Um, and I'll signal, I'm okay, the boat's just over here. It's a nice clear communication. Oh, you know, okay, boat's just over here. But you can see there's the nervousness uh, because they're constantly looking at their gauges. Mm -hmm. So at which point then I will angle the dive and bring them so that we can now see the line or see the ladder. And once they can see the boat, that, that stress, that stressor yeah. goes away completely and we can continue to bimble around the bottom uh, just underneath the boat whilst, whilst we're there. So it's been able to recognize that, that potential stressor yeah. before it becomes a problem. You know, as a dive professional, as a, as a dive guide, it is making sure that you're not just leading a dive and looking for stuff that you can point out. And it's being aware of where your divers are, what's going on particularly when they're inexperienced and you know at Whirlpool where we come up from the wreck and up yeah. the reef wall inexperienced divers sometimes forget to let the air out of their BCD and before you know it you've got an uncontrolled ascent yeah. so I tend to swim up the wall backwards um, mm -hmm. monitoring people letting them know let some air out of your BCD as yeah. we're coming up mm -hmm. um, just as a, a little reminder for them. I think it's important for new dive pros to realize that guiding dives for certified divers doesn't mean that they are actually experienced and confident divers all the time because sometimes people just get very comfortable, just, ah, oh, yeah, they're all certified, let's take them. That is yeah, true. Yeah, that's not, yeah. You, you remember Hand Crusher? Yep, yeah, Hand Crusher. Yeah. So yes. a, a lady diver that we had with us just recently, we call her Hand Crusher because she would crush your hand as she holds it, as very, very nervous, very um, uh, insecure person in the water. Anxious. Uh, very, very anxious, anxious, that's the word I was looking yeah. for. And, um, needed a lot of reassurance um, and um, crushed my hand. Um, <laughs> The other thing that's very, very important that not a lot of diapers actually realize that it's part of the job is the entertaining part. And when I say entertainer, it's not only underwater by showing a lot of stuff, but it's also being a good host when they first arrive in the morning, for example, before going diving. Uh, and then during our surface interval, for example, uh, engaging and just trying to keep up conversation. That's a very that, good that, point. That's a very, a very important part of the service that you're providing in the dive operation. When somebody's with you, let's assume they're coming out for a morning dive session and they're with us for maybe four hours. Mm -hmm. Out of that four hours, less than half the time they're in the water. Yeah. So they're looking for a complete experience. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so we, we find it with a lot of divers, particularly if they get cold, that they're not very good at socializing at that point, not very good at engaging. And so yeah. our role, particularly on surface intervals, yeah. is as the divers come on, is to change over all their equipment and make sure that everything is checked and tested. Or if they're if they're changing over their equipment, eyes on just yeah. to make sure that you know they're doing it right because it's us that have to deal with equipment malfunctions where it's not been set up properly in the water. Or in our case what usually happens they change their own gear and they forget to take the bungee of the tank oh, yeah. so they put the regulator on top of the of the of the bungee and then they're attached to the boat yeah go diving with the bench yes, yeah exactly. it keeps it nice and clean yes. um, it's a drag for them though um but it's it's then you know uh, socializing with them and, and and creating more of that from that experience uh, yeah. that, it, that it becomes a complete diving experience where you're engaging with other clients but you're also engaging with the staff and it's a nice synergy as it all yeah. kind of flows ar around the boat uh whilst we're on there and that's part of the diving life style. It is. You know, I mean, everywhere where you go diving, it's very dynamic, it's very fun. People are usually on holiday, so they want to have fun. Yeah. And they want to be relaxed and they want to get to know new people. Yeah. yeah. And, and it's, it's part of closing that entire yeah. um, customer relationship loop that if they're having a good experience when they first arrive, they have a good experience on the dive, they have a good experience uh, uh, on the surface interval on the second dive. And then we close the loop by having a debrief, um, talking about what we've seen, talking about the, 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 the fish life, talking about the quality and all that sort of stuff. Yeah. And having a a, a good laugh at it as well we've been the entertainers yeah. um, we've put ourselves out there and the clients have had a, a great experience which is just what we want the likelihood is they're gonna stay diving whether that's with us or whether that's with other dive operators it's uh, like an upsell opportunity as well because they can recommend you to other I mean in our case we have a lot of yatis coming here so yeah it's just a word to mouth, mouth thing yeah and it keeps going and we keep uh, yeah getting people exactly. out of recommendations so yeah so how does this all happen? Does it happen by magic? Do we wave a wand? Um, Wiggle your nose. Like bewitched. Yeah. Yeah, I can't do that. 
Really yeah, no, no, no. <laughs> yeah, I'd go for the wand, yeah. kind of, kind of yeah, Hogwarts yeah. style. Yeah. Yeah. No, it doesn't. No, um, it also doesn't come from reading a book because this isn't in any book. And this is where the dive master training process comes in. This is where learning to be a dive master with a good dive operation and getting that hands-on experience after or during the, the, the initial training. Because yeah. I think during the initial training, we're teaching you the, the, the this is what the textbook tells us to do. Yeah. This is what the performance requirements are. But learning so much more about being a dive professional, being a dive guide with yeah. the operation, you know, once the core learning is done, learning about um, uh, logistics and planning, learning about safety and risk management, learning about how to keep your head on a swivel and constantly be looking for your divers, um, and, and being able to preempt any problems, getting rid of jazz hands, and being clear in your your your, your hand communication and how we can link them together, uh, big gestures, solid gestures. Yeah. Um, well, what usually happens when you're doing your dive master and you're a student and you get to have all the dive pros playing as new divers for you, you don't quite believe that they're gonna act like that until you have the first. <laughs> group of real divers and you discover oh yeah they those are problems like are actually real yes. they are like that and some of them are even worse so yeah yeah I mean we've never used hand crusher on a on, yeah on no a yeah we've never DM. done that no, yeah, maybe we should, we should. We yeah. Should. yeah and of course we have to learn particularly if we're slightly introverted or if we're new to the industry and everything's big and wild and you know why would anybody be interested in hearing what I've got to say we have to learn how to yeah. be an entertainer. We have to learn how to be a communicator and engage with people, particularly, you know, we see this with some of the youngsters that we've got uh, doing their dive masters, whether they're 18, 19, 20, um, and they're engaging with clients who might be 50, 60. How does yeah. a 19 year old talk to a 60 year old? Yeah, exactly. Well, we have to learn that. We have yeah. to learn how we engage and how we, we attract those people. Yeah. So once we've been through this training process, diving is never the same again. Once you've pulled back that curtain and have yeah. a look yeah. at how a dive operation really works, and once you've learned those skills and developed those skills, mm -hmm. this becomes the new normal. It does change it, the, the way you dive, it does change the way you approach a dive, it does change the way you think about diving, um, and it becomes a new normal, it's just a different normal to a fun diver. It's still fun though, always. Oh hell yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, would, I wouldn't well, give still, it up. Yeah, we're still love. Yeah, yeah, me, yeah, me neither. Yeah. Well, thank you for watching our video today. Hopefully you've learned a little bit more about switching from a recreational diver to a dive professional. If you've enjoyed this video, make sure you splash down on the like button and do us a massive favor and subscribe. YouTube loves subscribers, uh, so do we. And uh, most importantly, keep diving. See you soon. Cool. I think that's gonna be a good one. I think so too.